Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 1 is titled Paul and the Ephesians. It's ready for teaching on July 1. The author is Dr. John McVeigh and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. The author of our series of lessons is Dr. John K. McVeigh, who is the President and Professor of Religion at Walla Walla University in College Place, Washington, USA, where he has served since 2006. He reads the introduction to the series of lessons for us right now. Thank you, Dr. John. Ephesians, How to Follow Jesus in Trying Times In the epistle to the Ephesians, Paul tells us about the Ephesians themselves. Years after the exciting events of the early days of Christian mission in Ephesus, the Ephesians struggled with the significance of their Christian faith. Paul, once the troubler of the economy of this fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, is now sidelined and imprisoned. Writing from prison, he worries that the believers in Ephesus may lose heart forgetting any active sense of what it means to be disciples of Jesus in the sophisticated, urban, and thoroughly pagan culture of Ephesus. Though his hearers are already Christians, Paul's tone is one of recruitment. He seeks to re-enlist them in Christian faith, to reignite the fire of their devotion to Christ, and to resurrect the excitement of being part of God's great enterprise in the world, the Church. Because the Christian faith is all about Christ, Paul radiates admiration and worship of him. If wobbly Christian disciples are to regain their footing, it will be because they recapture their first love for Jesus and establish fresh trust in his grace and power. So Paul highlights Christ's exaltation in heaven above all the powers and deities that seek to attract the devotion of believers in Ephesus. Jesus is the goal of the divine plan for the ages, a plan in which believers, as the church, play an important role in God's plans to unify all things in Christ. As Paul seeks to draw believers in Ephesus into fresh devotion to their Lord, he does not dumb down the demands of Christian discipleship. He spells out in some detail what Christian behavior and community look like, Christians are called to spirit-inspired, Christ-honoring, God-directed worship, which Paul illustrates again and again. A devotion to Christ impacts how one acts and speaks. To love Christ means to respect and value fellow believers. It means resisting the patterns of mean-spirited and sexually decadent behavior so rampant in their culture. It means, in our relationships within church and household, borrowing from the example of self-sacrifice offered by Christ. It means offering fellow citizens of Ephesus clear examples of a new pattern of human existence. Paul spends a good deal of his letter expressing his excitement for this new pattern of what it means to be human through membership in God's church. He is especially invigorated by the thought that God has joined estranged segments of humanity, Jews and Gentiles, as one in the church. In living out unity where hostility would be expected, they have an opportunity to exhibit the characteristics of God's new society and the coming kingdom. In pursuing the importance of being part of God's church, Paul develops four metaphors for the church. Believers make up the body of Christ, demonstrating their devotion to Christ and their unity with each other. They are a living temple, built through the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, in which God is worshipped. They are the bride of Christ, who look toward a grand marriage ceremony when the bridegroom comes to claim them as his own. In a final metaphor that expresses Paul's efforts to re-enlist them in Christian faith, they are the army of Christ, which wages peace in his name, combating the forces of darkness in God's strength as they look toward Christ's return. Ephesians, then, speaks especially to times like our own in which the allure of the world and the passing of time threaten to dull Christian discipleship. It lifts up Christ and accents the significance of following him as engaged, active members of his church as we live out the hope of his return. 
This quarter, we have the privilege of listening prayerfully to Ephesians and experiencing anew the excitement of following Jesus in challenging times. Sabbath afternoon, June 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word, so precious to us from so many different countries around the world, as we study your word together this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to bless us. And as we start this quarter's series of lessons on the book of Ephesians, we just thank you that we can come to you and ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us. We see in this book, Lord, so many truths that we as a people need, that we as individuals need, that we as families need. And we pray that you will be with us and bless us. We know that we've studied this series of lessons in 1903, 1908, 1928, 1945, 1971, and again in 2005. But now, through fresh eyes, opening your word, we pray that we will be blessed this quarter quarter. And as we open your word today, I'd like to particularly pray for those who are listening in Kingaroy, Queensland, for Diana Masifa in Johannesburg in South Africa, from uh, Moneto Wellington in Georgetown, for M. Kramer in Utah, for Lindale Daniel in Antigua, the Mother and Son 1987 in South Philippine Adventist College, Western Allen from Granada, Jimmy Stoner, Pastor Bertram Lavallis from Panama, Gina Hoffman in Ohio, those who are listening in Adelaide, South Australia, and those in Papatoe and Papakura in New Zealand. Lord, I pray that you'll bless each of them and that your word will not only come to fruition in their lives, but may be a guide for them in their lives as well. Bless us as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Let's read that again, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fulfilment of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. When we write something, we have a purpose for doing so, sometimes a weighty one. Abraham Lincoln, for instance, wrote his famous Gettysburg Address in 1863 after the terrible devastation in the American Civil War battle there, which left about 7,000 soldiers dead. In that address, invoking the Founding Fathers, Lincoln expressed his belief that the Civil War was the ultimate test as to whether the nation created in 1776 would endure or would perish from the earth, as he said. Paul has a profound purpose that motivates his letter, partly because of his imprisonment, as recorded in Ephesians 3.13 and Ephesians 6.20, and partly because of ongoing persecution and temptations, the Ephesians are tempted to lose heart. Paul reminds them of what happened when they were converted, accepting Christ as their Saviour and becoming part of the church. They have become Christ's body, he talks about in Ephesians 1, 19-23 and Ephesians 4, 1-16. The building materials in a temple in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19-22 the Bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, 21-33, and a well-equipped army he talks to them about in Ephesians 6, verses 10-20. They play a strategic role in fulfilling God's grand plan to unite everything in Christ, as he expresses in our memory text today, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Paul writes to awaken the believers in Ephesus to their full identity and privileges as followers of Christ. Sunday, June 25. Paul, Evangelist to Ephesus. 
What does Paul do on his first visit to Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey? Let's read Acts 18, verses 18 to 21. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centuria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire with a population of about 250,000. It was the capital of one of the empire's richest provinces, the province of Asia, which covered much of what we know today as Asia Minor. In Paul's day, the province was enjoying a time of growth and prosperity. A port city, Ephesus was also at the crossroads of important land routes. While the people worshipped many deities in the city, Artemis, regarded as the protector goddess of the city, was supreme. Her worship was the focus of civic ceremonies, athletic games and annual celebrations. Artemis was called Diana by the Romans, as we see in Acts 19, verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, the silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. And verse 35. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Paul later returns to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, which we read about in Acts 19, verses 1 to 12, and remains there for three years. Acts 19, 1 to 12, Then it happened, while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after them, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But When some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And he remained there for three years. It says in Acts 20, verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. The Apostle makes a significant time commitment to Ephesus, with the intention of firmly founding Christianity there. What strange event led to widespread reverence for the Lord Jesus in Ephesus? We read about this in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 20. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, 
there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man, in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practised magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily, and prevailed. Luke shares the same story of seven itinerant Jewish exorcists in the city, mingling the names of both Jesus and Paul in their incantations proves to be a misguided venture for these exorcists. When the news flashes through the streets of the city, as it says in verse 17, everyone was awestruck and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. The event also had a profound impact on some of those who had already become believers, who publicly burned their expensive handbooks of magic arts worth 50,000 silver coins, as we read in Acts 19.19. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. With the wider residents of the city, believers learn that the worship of Jesus must not be diluted with the worship of anything or anyone else. And so to finish the day, what did the burning of their own books signify, even at such an expense to themselves? What does that say about a total commitment to the Lord? Monday, June 26, a riot in the amphitheatre. Read Acts chapter 19, verses 21 to chapter 20, verse 1. What lessons can we draw from this story? Let's begin at Acts 19 and verse 21. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods, which are made with hands. So, not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised, and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theatre with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go to the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theatre. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defence to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew... All with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is 
temple guardian of the great goddess, Diana, and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another, but if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Paul's witness in the large, sophisticated city of Ephesus was so effective that it impacted an important economic engine for the city. Tourism focused on the Temple of Artemis. And what a temple it was! This magnificent structure was composed partly of 127 pillars, each 60 feet high, of Parian marble, a pure white, flawless marble, highly prized for sculptures. 36 of these pillars were sculpted and overlain with gold, earning the temple its reputation as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Concerned that Paul's anti-idolatry rhetoric was draining financial support from the temple, as we read in verse 27, Demetrius the silversmith whipped his fellow craftsmen into a frenzy. A rapidly expanding and highly energised crowd swept from the marketplace into the large amphitheatre, which seated some 25,000 people. There the commotion continued, featuring two continuous hours of shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, as we read in verse 34. After the crowd is dispersed by the town clerk, Paul meets with the believers and leaves the city. At the end of his third missionary journey, Paul meets with elders of the Ephesian church. How would you summarise Paul's concerns as we read in Acts 20 verses 17 to 38? From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the thing that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have been preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. 
I have shown you in every way by labouring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. A tentative chronology of Paul's relationship to Ephesus. AD 52, Paul's initial brief visit to Ephesus, is recorded in Acts 18, verses 18 to 21. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a little longer with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And then, A.D. 53 to A.D. 56, Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus. We've just read about that in chapter 19. He composes 1 Corinthians near the end of his stay, as we read in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 5 to 9. Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. And it may be that I will remain, or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And AD 57, while at Miletus, Paul meets with the elders from Ephesus, which we've just read about in Acts 20, verses 17 to 38. And then, A.D. 62, Paul composes his letter to the Ephesians, probably from confinement in Rome. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears, said Paul in Acts 20, verse 31, to finish the day. What do you think Paul would warn our church about today, and why? Tuesday, June 27, Hearing the Letter to the Ephesians Paul wrote Ephesians to be read aloud in the house churches of believers in Greater Ephesus. In the intervening years since Paul's departure, the Christian movement in Ephesus had grown, and the number of house churches had multiplied. For those early believers, it would have been an important event to have Tychicus, the personal representative of the founding Apostle Paul, stand among them and share a letter from him. As suggested by the epistle itself, the assembled group likely included members of the host household, father, mother, children and slaves, as we read in Ephesians 5, 21 through to chapter 6, verse 9. Submitting to one another in the fear of God, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service or as men pleases, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good any one does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. At the time, a household included others as well. Clients, they were free persons who depended on the householder for support, and even customers. So these may be present too, as well as members of other households. In conjunction with the outline of the letter below, read through the entire epistle, preferably out loud. It will take about 15 minutes to do so. What themes echo through the letter as a whole? And is something quite different and special? Let's do that right now. Because the author has divided the book of Ephesians up into 13 parts. There's an opening greeting, an introductory blessing, praying for believers. It finishes with stand together, the church is the army of God, and a closing greeting. Well, let's begin in chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 1 and 2. It's an opening greeting. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's the introductory blessing, which is chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And then from verses 15 to 23, praying for believers to receive Christ-focused wisdom. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, 
and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then we start chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. It's titled, Once Spiritually Dead, Now Exalted with Christ. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then from verse 11 to 22, Christ's creation of the church out of Jews and Gentiles. Therefore remember that you... Once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ." For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And then we start chapter 3 from verses 1 to 13, and it's titled, Paul as Preacher of Christ to the Gentiles. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, 
who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the Church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purposes which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access through confidence, through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And part 7, Praying for Believers to Experience the Love of Christ we read Ephesians three, fourteen to 21 For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes a knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations for ever and ever. Amen. And part eight. Hold on to the Spirit-inspired unity of the Church, we read in Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended... What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And then from Ephesians 4, 17-32, live the new unity-nurturing life. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness." But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, 
putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And then, we start chapter 5, reading verses 1 to 20. It's titled, Walk in Love, Light and Wisdom. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God." Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ." submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, that actually started the next part, which is practice Christ-shaped life in the Christian household. It goes from the last verse of chapter 5 to verse 9 in chapter 6. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church." Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord." Bond servants, 
Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. And then chapter 6 verses 10 to 20, stand together the church as the army of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And it finishes with the last four verses of chapter 6. It's a closing greeting. But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And to finish today, what key theme seems to come through in this letter? What does it say to you? What specific point or points touch home? Wednesday, June 28. Ephesians in its time. How does Paul begin and end his letters to the believers in Ephesus? What do we learn about his deepest desires for them? Well, let's look at Ephesians 1, 1 and 2 and Ephesians 6, 21 to 26. Let's begin in Ephesians 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the conclusion in chapter 6, beginning at verse 21. But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. At the outset of the letter, Paul identifies himself as the author in verse 1. Near the middle of the letter, Paul again identifies himself by name, labelling himself the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, in Ephesians 3 verse 1, which introduces a personal reflection on his work as an apostle, which we read in verses 1 to 13 of chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, 
the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of the God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Near the end of the letter he again refers to his imprisonment, in Ephesians 6, verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I might speak boldly as I ought to speak. And he concludes with personal words, as we read in Ephesians 6, 21-22. While some scholars deny that the letter was written by Paul, it's important to note that the epistle clearly lays claim to Paul as its author. Most Christians accept, and rightly so, Paul as the author. How does Paul worry about the effect his imprisonment will have on believers in Ephesus? Let's look at Ephesians 3 verse 13. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Ephesians seems to share the same general timing and circumstances with other letters Paul writes from prison. Colossians and Philemon. Also, considerable time seems to have passed since Paul's ministry in Ephesus, as we read in Ephesians 1, verse 15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, and chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Paul probably composed Ephesians in a prison in Rome about 62 AD. In Ephesians, Paul offers few specifics about the situation of his audience in Ephesus. The scope of his attention is wide. He deals with a grand span of time, beginning with God's decisions made before the foundation of the world, as he wrote in chapter 1 verse 4, and reflects broadly on grand themes of God's salvation offered in Christ. In doing so, the letter exhibits an exalted literary style with long sentences, repetitive expressions, and developed metaphors. Paul can use such a style elsewhere as he did in Romans 8 verses 31 to 39, but it is concentrated in Ephesians, which features a great deal of praise, prayer and worship language, as can be seen in chapter 1 in two places in Ephesians chapter 3, and offers carefully crafted highly rhetorical passages, as in chapter 4, 5 and 6. Thursday, June 29. Ephesians, a Christ-saturated letter. How does Paul announce the theme of his letter? Well, let's have a look at verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. 
How can the message of Ephesians be summarised? From prison, Paul sets forth a vision of God's Christ-centred plan for the fullness of time and the Church's role in it. God has acted in Christ to initiate his plan to unite all things in him, that's Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, as we read in verse 10. And he did so by creating the church as an entity composed of one new humanity of both Jews and Gentiles, as we read in chapter 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Believers are called to act in concert with this divine plan, signalling to the evil powers that God's ultimate purpose is underway, as you read in chapter 3 and verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. In Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, which we read at the beginning of today's lesson, proclaims the unity God has in mind is centred in Christ. So, it is no surprise to discover that Ephesians is a Christ-drenched letter that everywhere praises the actions of God in Christ and celebrates the access of believers to the spiritual resources offered them in Christ. Paul employs the phrase in Christ, and similar phrases more than 30 times, and everywhere lifts up Jesus. As you read the letter, watch for these phrases and stay alert to the many ways Paul focuses on Jesus. Paul seeks to reignite the spiritual commitment of believers in Ephesus by reminding them that they are part of the church, which is at the heart of God's plan to unify all things in Christ. When he uses the word church, the Greek word ecclesia in the letter, he means the universal church or the church at large rather than a local congregation. A principal strategy he uses is to talk about the church, and he does so by using vivid metaphors, four of which he develops in some detail. One, the church as a body, as we read in Ephesians 1, verses 22 to 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And the church as a building temple in chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And three, the church as a bride, in Ephesians 5, 22 to 27. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And for... The church is an army. In Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, 
having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. Each one of these images, the body, the building temple, the bride, the army, in its own way reveals what God's purpose and intention for his church is. And so to finish today, in the church of which you are a part, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God is drawing together a transnational, multilingual, multiracial, cross-cultural community, as we read in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, that points the way to the fulfilment of His plan to unite all things in Jesus, as our text for today said in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. How can we work in concert with God's grand plan? Let's read that text from Revelation that describes us as a transnational, multilingual, multiracial, cross-cultural community. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Friday, June 30 the story of the exorcists misusing the names of Jesus and Paul in Acts 19, 13-20, as we read in Sunday's Letterson, helps explain why Paul uses so much language about power in Ephesians. Some new believers, under fresh conviction of the sovereignty of Jesus, throw their expensive magic manuals into the flames. Thanks to the discovery of some 250 papyri, dealing with magic as well as other finds, we have ample illustrations of rituals, spells, formulas, curses, etc., similar to those likely featured in these manuals of magic. The volumes had advised believers how to conduct such rituals to persuade gods, goddesses and spirit powers to do whatever they would ask. Luke tells us that these volumes were worth 50,000 silver coins or 50,000 days of wages. In today's setting, if you allow for, let's say, $80 a day of wages for a skilled labourer, this amounts to $4 million. This detail demonstrates the importance and centrality of these volumes to their everyday lives. Clinton E. Arnold, in his book titled Ephesians, page 34, wrote, it took the sovereign intervention of God for them to be sufficiently convicted that they should completely repent of their ongoing utilization of amulets, charms, invocations, and traditional means of gaining spiritual power. End of quote. He also wrote in the book Power and Magic, The Concept of Power in Ephesians, page 165, we come to understand that Ephesians was written to believers who needed instruction about how to cope with the continuing influence and attacks of the sinister cosmic powers. End of quote. Paul's response is the epistle to the Ephesians, in which he points to Christ as the one who has been exalted above every power in Ephesians 1, 20-23, and emphasises the superiority of the strength that God provides to believers in chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 6. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. There are three. One, what powers or authorities are active in our world and your life today? 
How do these powers manifest themselves, tempting believers to honour and respect them rather than to give undiluted loyalty to the exalted Christ? 2. In the context of God's fullness of time plan to unite all things in Christ, Paul expresses hope for the future. Review his uses of the word hope in Ephesians 1 verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and in Ephesians 2 verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Why does he believe there is hope for the future? And question 3. In the following passages in Ephesians, how does Paul point to the great future hope of Christ's return? Firstly, Ephesians 1, 13-14, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And chapter 1, verse 21, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And chapter 2, and verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And Ephesians 4 verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And chapter 5 verse 5, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God, what does this hope mean for us right now? And now for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Bible Survives Blaze by Tor Teriansen. Valentina Melentieva watched helplessly as her home burned to the ground in Kongsberg, Norway. While she was sad to lose her life's possessions, the thought of losing her Bible devastated her the most. Valentina grew up in Klaipeda, the third largest city of then Soviet Republic of Lithuania. Although her mother was a Christian, her family never owned a Bible, never talked about Jesus and never prayed. When Valentina was 45, she noticed that a neighbour named Ira seemed happy even though she endured struggles. Valentina asked Ira about the secret to her happiness, and Ira invited her to her home. When Valentina arrived, Ira placed an open Bible in her hands. For the first time in her life, Valentina held a Bible. It was open to Exodus 20. Please read, Ira said. Valentina began reading the Ten Commandments. When she reached the Fourth Commandment, she was shocked to read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, found in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 10 in the New King James Version. Four times she read the Sabbath commandment. The seventh day, not Sunday, was the day of rest. For her entire life she had worked on Saturdays, but now she wanted to live according to the fourth commandment. The next day, Valentina went with Ira to worship with other Seventh-day Adventists in Klaipeda. On her second Sabbath in church, Valentina received a new Bible in the Russian language. The book became her most treasured possession, and she was baptised a year later in 2004. Later, Valentina moved to Norway to learn more about God at an Adventist Bible school. By the time she completed the course, the Bible's cover had become well-worn. She commissioned a beautiful leather cover for the Bible. After the 2021 fire, the police and fire brigade cordoned off Valentina's apartment. 
When their investigation ended, Valentina's visiting son walked through the rubble. Valentina was overjoyed when her son returned with the Bible. The Bible, which had been standing on a shelf with other spiritual books, was the only book to remain intact. It suffered only minor fire damage. It is amazing what the love of God can do to preserve the most important thing, Valentina said. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering three years ago that helped open a centre of influence in Shortland, Norway, where more people can learn about Valentina's favourite book, the Bible. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful. 